So those of you with your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 7, verse 37. Stuff we'll get to eventually. <laughs> John 7 and 37. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living, living water will flow from his heart. Lord God, I thank you for your promise, for your open arms, for your care and love for each of us. I pray you would bless this service and let it be for your will. Amen. So, kind of coming in in the middle of the story here. Jesus is at one of the large Jewish festivals. One that he had specifically been challenged to attend by his own brothers. To proclaim himself as the Messiah, if that's really who you are. I don't... I attempt to exhibit Christian character, of course, but there are times where my patience runs out, including with anyone who wants to talk about Jesus not having siblings. I mean, not terribly great siblings, granted, since they spend to, seem to spend a majority of their time bullying him for the whole claiming to be the Son of God thing. At least one of them learns better after the cross, to be fair. But Jesus ignores them. I'm not going to the festival, not if you guys are going to run around making a big deal out of this. Uh, promptly sneaks out to the festival anyways. Um, mostly to sit in the background, doing typical Jesus things, arguing with Pharisees, a little bit of miracle here and there. Final day, big climax of the festival, apparently has enough, stands up, shuts to the masses, anyone who believes in me can, may come and drink. For rivers of living water. Throughout the Bible, God is pretty closely, closely associated with fire. There's lots of examples of that. Burning bush, Pentecost, Revelations. Something we perhaps focus on a little less is how often he is associated with water. We've got a great flood, water baptism. And this is not the first time, not even in the book of John, that Jesus claims to be living water, or more accurately at least, he offers people living water. The next verse will go on to clarify that the living water, here at least, is the Holy Spirit. That this is Jesus promising that it will come down to his followers on Pentecost. A couple interesting things there. The Bible says that it had not arrived. I at least interpret this as the Holy Spirit has not arrived in this specific place on these specific people yet. I think you can easily make the argument that the Holy Spirit is present throughout the Old Testament. Um, this Elisha feller we were discussing today and his spirit following his servant down, I think... I tend to agree with the idea that the Old Testament prophets are spirit-filled, and that's why they stand out so much compared to the rest of the Israelites, who of course had the option to follow Moses up on the mountain, but chose not to, so actually seem to have less of a personal connection with God than literally everyone else, but not to go too far down the chosen people rabbit hole today. I think the much more obvious and interesting thing here is to have the Holy Spirit described as living water. Because that's pretty contradictory to the upper thing it's described as, right? Tons of flame. It gets both fire and water imagery. And air imagery. Right? A mighty rushing wind. All you need is, is one more is earth and you'd have all four of them. Uh, if you buy into, into pagan... Greek elements, but frankly, I think you can still use uh, modern earth er elements that are actually elements. Uh, was it borite? Boron? Boron. Boron. Right. It's a cleaning material. God cleans us. Uh, it strengthens iron or steel, one of those two. 
Just like the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, we strengthen each other. That's the whole point of church. God strengthens all of us. And I believe it was said it could be used as rocket fuel. And that's, in a lot of ways, what experiences with God is. It's the equivalent of rocket fuel for us. So there you go. I can preach on Borat. Take that. Um, whatever. It is this borax. is baby. 20 meal tin borax. That's what they called it. <laughs> cool. You're, see, you guys thought it was just a sermon. You're learning the periodic table today. <laughs> Not only has Jesus previously been compared to living water and has himself offered living water, but it's symbolism that, as usual, can be found in the Old Testament as well. As long as we're going over things that we should probably all lack patience for, any suggestion that the Old Testament and the New Testament are dramatically different is a bit silly. I challenge anyone to read Isaiah and come away with the conclusion that they're two, for, two different books about two different gods, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, plenty of examples, especially from Psalms. I, however, have Hosea, chapter 14, starting with verse 4. The Lord says, Then I will heal you of your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone forever. I will be to Israel like a refreshing dew from heaven. Israel will blossom like the lily. It will send roots deep into the soil like the cedars in Lebanon. Its branches will spread out like beautiful olive trees, as fragrant as the cedars of Lebanon. My people will again live under my shade. They will flourish like grain and blossom like grapevines. They will be as fragrant as the wines of Lebanon. And there it's not even really a body of water as we would understand it. It's not a river, not a lake, not an ocean. It's just dew. Just the little water droplets you get in the morning. I mean, again, really, none of this should be remotely surprising. He's the god of creation. Of course, he is associated with it at times. But I find the water comparison particularly important because there are only really a small handful of things that scientists say life requires, just point-blank, period, non-negotiable. And interesting, the one that usually gets mentioned first isn't like the obvious ones. We don't go, uh, heat, oh, you know, Mars is too far away, it's too cold, Mercury is too close, it's too warm. Well, we don't know other species, they could be more or less cold or heat resistant. There are plenty of animals on Earth that do better in Antarctica or the Sahara, depending on whether you're talking camels or penguins. You don't hear necessarily. Uh, gravity mentioned that often. Oh, the gravity on Jupiter is just way too heavy. I feel like the lack of solid land mass is probably more relevant for Jupiter. Because theoretically, there can just be creatures who are better adapted to gravity than we are. I mean, there's stuff living on the bottom of the ocean that can crack a nuclear submarine open. If you can survive that kind of water pressure, surely there's animals out there, even if they do have to sadly look like a blobfish that could survive much higher gravitational forces. No, one of the few non-negotiable things that people pretty solidly say life has to have to exist, at least life as we know it, Star Trek quote, is water. You can't get very far without that H2O stuff. It provides so much of the fuel that we need to operate. The refreshing cold water. It is one of the luckiest things, I think, that we live in Nevada, an area so reminiscent of the Middle East and where Israel was. So out of all these agricultural contexts and references and ideas present in the Bible that we don't quite get as a post-industrial society, water we grasp. Water is just as important to us, to Vegas, to Phoenix now, as it was to them, to Damascus, to Jerusalem, water is the lifeblood of the desert. And Christ, describing himself not just as water, but as living water, so much greater and powerful than the stuff that 
you know, defines 80% of our planet's surface, is one of his many bold claims. Back in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 7, the, um, the famous section where Christ mentions living water, and I personally kind of think what he was probably thinking about when he uses living water as an analogy to the masses, only a couple short chapters later. So John 4 and 7, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. I mean, it's a dead horse and then some, but the man's refusal to answer any question with a straight answer. But this one especially, I think we should definitely co-opt and copy. Like, if you ever want to use, what would Jesus do? I think someone attempting to start some racial tension should always be answered with, man, if you only knew God, you wouldn't be like this. That's the only appropriate response to bigotry as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, it may get you punched in the face, but you will have the moral high ground. Anyways, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? We like to harp on about how different a time this was and how much these people's thinking was different compared to ours, but really it seems the same to me. This seems like a literal, fact-based people who just don't seem to grasp analogies, metaphors, poetic, artistic language, which sounds very much like today. And it's not just this woman, we won't pick on her specifically, but so often the Pharisees, Christ's own disciples, they will hear what is obviously a parable, what could not possibly be anything but metaphorical speech, and will immediately answer it with the most straightforward, literal-minded possible answer. This dude Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. Oh, you need to be born again to be saved. I gotta climb back in there? Really? That's your first thought? You think he's being literal? Really? There's this random hobo man sitting by a well in the middle of, of the field, and he offers you living water, and your first reaction is, you don't got a bucket. Really? <laughs> Again, it sounds like today, it sounds like arguing with our conceited, stuck-up, arrogant, modern man who thinks if Harvard doesn't acknowledge it, it can't possibly be true. We're so advanced, so scientifically minded, so forward-thinking that we have come to the point where if we cannot physically touch it, we borderline refuse to believe in it. And it's such a small, small view of the universe. And again, such an incredibly arrogant one. How about we go actually be on a different planet before we start acting like we know everything about the universe? Heck, let's explore more than like half of our own ocean before we start acting like we know everything. Let's actually figure out how gravity works, etc., etc., etc. I could go on. But, back to the scripture. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. This story is famous and well liked for a reason. Uh, one of the many obvious reasons is that it is Jesus actively 
interacting with and evangelizing a Samaritan, just continuing to drive home and make prominent the point that the gospel is for everyone, that the good news is for Jew, Greek, Roman, Samaritan, Chinese, American, Brazilian, etc., etc., etc. It is for everyone. There is no restrictions on race, color, class, or creed. But also because of its simplicity, because of how straightforward it is. And again, this is something that I think becomes almost undervalued in our intellectual society where no one ever thinks the curtains are just blue, where no one is ever okay with just saying, oh, you should eat a banana, it's good for you. No, no, no. you got to dive into the potassium nitrates and break it down to the biological level to explain why it's good for you. You can't ever be satisfied with just, I feel better after I eat it. We get so mixed up in all the convoluted, long word essays. I think sometimes we forget some of the most basic stuff. Why be a Christian? Why follow Christ? Why believe in this stuff? Real simple. It's true. <laughs> that is... I hate to sum up apologetics so succinctly. And of course, it should be more complicated than that. Christians should always be capable of arguing to the ends of the earth with historians, scientists, anything imaginable. I'm not being anti-knowledge, or at least I'm trying not to be. But I do think it really does come down to the very simple reality of who Christ is and what he does. And the idea of what he offers. Eternal life. Never being thirsty again. Perhaps not in the physical sense. Although there is plenty of people who fast for 40 days or more in the Bible. Which is pretty miraculous when you stop and think about it. I mean, humans realistically shouldn't go four hours without drinking water. Much less 40 days. But the eternal life... The freedom from thirst, not just in the physical sense of being parched, but being spiritually parched, spiritually dying of thirst, of having that gaping hole in your heart that all humans have, of having that hole straight through your soul and looking for something to fill it. And it's the ultimate stumbling block of being a pastor in the new millennia and having to come up with a better way of ending his sermons than a Donut Man reference. But, the long and short of it is that life without Jesus is like a donut. There is a hole in the middle of your heart. It's been a while since I've referenced that. But what Jesus offers is to fill that hole. What Jesus offers is to come down into the spiritual wasteland desert we have made of his beautiful creation and to offer us an oasis of His Spirit, His love, His living water, that we may never thirst again. And I am incredibly thankful and glad this morning that I have taken of that living water. And that you guys have too. So, before we dismiss this morning, is there any other needs, requests, questions, comments? Rock of the Church is the one I would go with for Earth. Yeah. Well, that's half a sermon. All right, then, if Brother Jerry would dismiss us and bless the food. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this service today. And we're thankful for the food we're about to eat. We ask that you bless it to our bodies, Lord. And uh, bless the hands that prepared it and the hands that will put everything away. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First of all, you stole my Poor Grandpa's still under the weather, huh? Still under the weather? Yeah, I can hear the congestion. I did enjoy having I'm I'm suing them.
because it made me laugh. <laughs>